A couple of weeks ago, I noticed an individual entering my house captured by the newly installed doorbell camera. Strangely, I couldn't detect them leaving. The intriguing part was that the footage had mysteriously disappeared the next day. This piqued my curiosity, prompting me to assume the role of a detective and commence an investigation. My ex-wife, Toby, who knows me well, became aware of my growing suspicions towards her actions. She believed that I had stumbled upon some incriminating evidence, possibly obtained from the recently installed doorbell camera, which she had subsequently erased. I was in the process of setting up cameras and recording devices in my home. However, she eventually confessed to an ongoing affair that had lasted for about a year, nearly the entire time I was away helping my elderly parent. Most of the week, I was focused on caring for my parent, unaware of what was happening. She acknowledged that I deserved better and suggested a fair divorce settlement, which involved selling our house and dividing the proceeds. There's a possibility that she may have to provide alimony for a period of time or a lump sum payment. We will also divide most of the debt, and the sale of the house is likely to clear that, leaving us with a fresh start and a small amount to rebuild. It's truly disappointing and feels like a letdown. I must admit that anger built up within me, and I initially desired revenge. However, there's hardly anyone to expose her to, and even if I did, it's unlikely anyone would care. On the affair partner's side, there's no one to expose either because he is single or already divorced. It appears that he was more aware of the state of my marriage than I was. Their relationship wasn't even significant, and it's possible that this wasn't her first time engaging in such behavior. However, I've decided not to dwell on it and avoid seeking further pain. This situation comes at a challenging time for me as I'm already dealing with elder care issues, and I simply don't have the energy or desire to fight for anything right now. She offered to try and repair things, but we both know there's too much pain and damage between us. She knows how deeply I was affected by being cheated on over 25 years ago, even before we got together. Some wounds never truly heal. Lately, I've been questioning whether our entire relationship was just a rebound but I'm the kind of person who is dedicated and committed once I make a decision. Perhaps I rushed into things too quickly, and now I'm losing faith in people and the worthiness of relationships. I can't envision myself ever trusting anyone again. So here I am, no confrontation, no revenge, no exposure, and no reason to hold on. Just two broken lives drifting apart without emotions. Now I have to figure out how to rebuild myself without my pride and ego. It's just another failure to add to the long list in my life. The life I once knew is over, and I'm merely going through the motions, handling things on autopilot. I don't even want to return home, but I must pack and prepare the house for sale. Then I'll need to find an apartment, although I'm unsure where I want to live. It all feels so disheartening. I wasted more than half my life on someone, and the road ahead seems like an empty void. The only reason I get out of bed is to take care of my parents. At least not having children is a blessing because once the divorce is finalized, I won't have to maintain contact with her. However, that will take time, and each time I hear her voice, it rekindles the pain. My way of hurting myself is by looking back at our pictures and reminiscing about the otherwise good times we shared. I just can't understand why I'm so stuck in the past, mourning something I thought I was ready to leave behind. I lie awake at night, analyzing everything, trying to make sense of it all. I made mistakes and now I feel inadequate, questioning why I deserve to be treated poorly and why my life is so difficult. It seems like I always end up on the losing side. Now I'm old, broken, and feeling unworthy of this challenging life. I have no hopes or dreams, just solitude with my own thoughts. Speaking of thoughts from last night, she hasn't reached out to me since I left, even though I explicitly told her not to. I meant what I said, and I suppose she understood. However, she hasn't offered a single apology or asked if I'm okay. Is she just at home, acting as if it's an ordinary Tuesday? Or maybe not. During the Christmas before last, we discussed how our intimate life had become stagnant. I mentioned that about 10 to 15 years ago, we experienced multiple premature births from IVF, which caused me to fear getting too close to her. I was terrified of the possibility of accidentally getting her pregnant and going through that loss again. This situation affected both of us mentally, and we sought help to overcome our deepest depressions, relying on support and luck. Now, I realize that I made things worse when she admitted to cheating on me for about a year. I said something truly hurtful, suggesting that she deserved to lose all our children because of the person she is. 
I'm contemplating sending her an apology text for that statement. However, do you think mentioning my past fears, which occurred over a year ago, triggered painful memories and led to her infidelity? I only shared these fears with my therapist, and we decided it wasn't the right time to discuss them with my wife. Perhaps she blames me for our years of intimacy issues. Maybe it's all my fault. Oh God, what have I done? After thinking about it, probably against my better judgment, I called her. I knew she probably wouldn't answer, so I left a voicemail, apologizing for what I said. I admitted that my words were hurtful and untrue. I'm sorry that we ended up in this situation, but I know it's over. Let's handle this like mature adults, not like the 20-somethings we were when we first met. I expressed my hope that she finds what she needs and left it at that. Last night, my wife called me. She appreciated my apology and understood that I said those hurtful things to intentionally cause pain. We didn't have an extensive conversation, just some apologies and the usual pleasantries. I mentioned that I'll be returning home this weekend, but requested that she not be there. The conversation was mostly civil, but I made it clear that I don't care where she goes. I even suggested that she stay with her boyfriend since that's who she wanted anyway. Of course, she denied it and kept insisting that she wants me back and that we can work things out. She pleaded for one chance, emphasizing that she has never done anything like this before and is willing to do anything to make it up. I must confess that all I desire is to go back in time, to any moment within the past year or even during the most challenging periods of our lives, rather than being here in the present. However, this time, I stood my ground and expressed to her that I don't see a viable path for us to be together anymore. Now, a whole year has elapsed, and I can't fathom feeling the same way about her. I only asked one question regarding the matter, and there was a prolonged silence before she responded. Reluctantly, she asked if I truly wanted to know, as she didn't wish to further hurt me. I simply stated that I needed to know, and that's when she shattered me even more. She revealed that it happened a few times in the beginning, but after approximately a month, it occurred almost daily while I was away, and even on some weekends for about six months. In the past few months, it transpired once or twice a week during my absence. I felt a wave of sickness wash over me, so I muted the call to release some of the pain. She had engaged in intimacy with him more times in a year than we had in the past 10 to 15 years, perhaps even surpassing the frequency during the early stages of our relationship. It was as if they had been together hundreds of times. I wanted to inquire further, such as if he was better or more endowed, or what activities they engaged in. I yearned to know what he provided that I couldn't, but I couldn't bear it any longer. I simply instructed her to spend the weekend with him, allowing me to be alone at home and sort through my belongings. Unfortunately, I don't have a permanent place to store my possessions. I've been awake and managed to acquire a bottle of fine scotch. Now, I have to work and care for my parent while dealing with a hangover. As agreed upon, I return to the house to retrieve some items. Thankfully, she is nowhere to be seen. I'm gathering documents I forgot last weekend and packing clothes and other belongings. Surprisingly, everything is progressing more swiftly than anticipated. I have my AirPods in, playing uplifting tunes to maintain a positive mindset. I proceed to the basement and begin packing a few items from there. It's challenging but I'm determined to keep moving forward before sinking too deeply into despair. While in the basement, I faintly hear the sound of water flowing through the pipes, blending with the melodies in my ears. It persists for a while before I notice it. I ascend the stairs and discover that the shower is running. I'm taken aback and think, what on earth? I decide to brew a cup of coffee and retreat to my car. Initially, I contemplated driving away, but instead, I find myself sitting in the driveway. I feel stunned by everything unfolding before me. I begin composing a lengthy and venomous text message, but then decide against sending it, as it could serve as evidence of something. Thus, I merely sit there and wait, hoping she will depart once again, while I remain outside. During this time, my new neighbor strolls by and introduces himself, observing me standing outside while enjoying a smoke. I refrain from disclosing anything to him, but I make an effort to maintain a friendly demeanor. Just as we are about to bid farewell, the garage door opens, and she emerges from behind her car, seeking to talk to me. I find myself engaged in introductions with this new neighbor and my wife, although we don't exchange many words. Even the new neighbor senses the tension and promptly exits. Once inside, I remain in a state of shock and simply ask her why she is here. 
She explains that she couldn't check into her new place until later and was at the gym, yes, that dreaded gym prior to arriving. She wanted to shower and retrieve a few more belongings, assuming I wouldn't mind and that her presence wouldn't pose a problem. I stand there, pondering who this unfamiliar person before me truly is. After a brief and awkward apology from her, she suggests that we shouldn't rush things while emotions are still raw. Perhaps we should consider more counseling, as she believes we still love each other. Blah, blah. I lock eyes with her and firmly reply, No, please leave. I have matters to attend to, and you agreed to stay away. I convey to her that this is the consequence of her actions and retreat back to the basement. I am currently sitting here, typing this, attempting to regain control over myself and my blood pressure. Thankfully, I just heard the garage door open and close, indicating her departure. However, I am still somewhat disheveled. I wish to resume packing, but my collection of bourbon stares back at me. I must confess, I already indulged in one drink earlier. If I were to have another this early in the day, things would only become more disastrous. All right, here's what unfolded on Sunday. It arrived after another sleepless night of packing and overwhelming misery. It was all so arduous, sifting through memories, photographs, and shared possessions. Our wedding album and various items only served to stir up more emotions. I made a concerted effort to maintain control, persevering and focusing on the items that held the most meaning for me. Unfortunately, one item hit me particularly hard, the sealed urn containing the ashes of our children. We had made plans that, upon the passing of one or both of us, our ashes would be combined and scattered in the ocean by our beloved beach. Well, those plans are clearly no longer feasible. However, the question arises, is it wrong for me to want to keep the urn with me? I mean, I understand that I eventually need to discuss this with her, but I have no idea how that conversation will unfold. I am uncertain if we can have the urn opened and the remains divided. Such an option feels inherently wrong, as if neither of us would truly possess them. I don't even know if such a course of action is possible, or even appropriate. I suppose I will inquire with my attorney once I have retained one. At that moment, I refrained from mentioning this to her, as my trust in her had plummeted to zero. Now, here's the current update. Sunday evening, I am nearly finished packing the items I will be taking with me, at least for now. I wanted to ensure that I had enough belongings to sustain me for a few weeks, in case I couldn't bear to return. I carefully selected important mementos and essential documents as well. We had agreed that she would return after 9 p.m. And truthfully, I didn't wish to be present when she arrived. I resisted the temptation to tamper with the electronics or the router, just to add a touch of chaos. I had the sense that, for once, I was displaying maturity thanks to the supportive calls and occasional messages from a friend. It was around 7 o'clock, and I was loading the last few items into my car. As expected, she appeared looking a bit shaken but nowhere near as distraught as I felt on the inside. She began talking about how it seemed like I was ready to leave once again, and if only I could spare a moment to converse with her. I was already irritated by her presence, and though I tried to remain strong, I knew it wouldn't be easy. I informed her that I didn't want to be too delayed, as I needed to return in time to relieve the weekend caregiver for my parent. I had only a few minutes to spare, but if there was something truly important, she could inform me, and if necessary, I could call her while driving. She claimed to understand and expressed a genuine desire to discuss what had transpired over the weekend without invoking my anger. She asserted that she had spent the weekend alone, yet I'm uncertain if I believe her. She reflected on everything that had occurred and the harm she had inflicted upon us. She acknowledged that forgiveness from me was unlikely, but professed that she still loved me and would forever be in love with me. She understood that her words held little credibility at present, but she was furious with herself for causing me such immense pain and destroying the man who had loved her unconditionally and had always been there for her. I fought against the urge to shout curse or embrace her, opting instead to maintain a stoic facade of indifference. I must admit, I failed. My eyes welled up with tears, though I struggled to prevent them from falling. I remained largely silent, merely listening and hoping to depart once she had conveyed what she needed to say. She spoke at length, providing justifications and reasons for her actions, explaining why she had persisted for so long, why she hadn't halted herself, and why she believed I didn't care or was unfaithful to her. According to her, she suspected that I had been involved in infidelity for many years 
and that we had transformed into mere roommates. Despite everything, she still recognized me as the only man with whom she wished to spend her life. She expressed a desire to confess numerous times, but was aware that divulging the truth would forever preclude the possibility of my accepting her back. She continued to insist that the fault lay entirely with her and not with me. She vowed to seek counseling to comprehend why she had engaged in such behavior for an extended period. She felt that our life together had been ruined because she had everything she desired and believed she could live without intimacy. It seemed as if she had come to terms with this reality. She even mentioned that I could pursue relationships with other people if I so desired, although it sounded like typical rhetoric from a cheater. However, she confirmed my suspicions. She brought up our conversation from the Christmas before last when she became furious because of my apprehension about getting physically close to her, fearing the possibility of her getting pregnant again. She believed that I used in vitro fertilization as an excuse and concluded that I never genuinely wanted her or a family, particularly since I was opposed to adoption. She was upset, feeling that our emotional connection and the sense of family were absent from our lives, and she held me responsible for depriving her of these. She was angry because she believed I blamed her for the loss of our children and accused me of lying about it. She felt that I found her repugnant for experiencing those losses and that my forgiveness was unattainable. However, she professed that she loved me enough for both of us throughout all those years, especially during the illness of my parent when they were discharged from the hospital. I used it as an excuse to avoid her abruptly. Then, it suddenly dawned on her, and her worst fears became a reality. All she wanted was to feel loved, yet she believed that I didn't love her and had been deceiving her all along. The so-called gym guy was never even on her radar until these issues arose. She had never even considered being unfaithful. Initially, she didn't have much emotional attachment to him, she did it out of spite. However, as time went on, she started longing for intimacy and informed him that it was solely about that. She had no intention of leaving me. She claimed that she never really discussed me with him, but now I have my doubts. Over time, she developed a connection with him and admitted to feeling something she hadn't felt in years, although it paled in comparison to what we shared. Eventually, she confessed that it was over with him and hoped I could forgive her and have a conversation about finding a way forward, even if it meant separating. Now she asked if we could take some time before proceeding with the divorce. She acknowledges the terrible nature of her actions, but firmly believes that I had been dishonest about certain matters for many years and should afford her the chance she feels she deserves. Honestly, I couldn't contain myself any longer and blurted out, do you genuinely believe you deserve a chance after a whole year of infidelity? I had shared my deepest fears in therapy, but I never anticipated a situation like this. So I kept them hidden. In the past few years, I had made a genuine effort to connect with her, be romantic, and engage, but she hardly acknowledged my endeavors. I thought that being vulnerable and sharing my deepest secrets would bring us closer and demonstrate how much I cared. However, she used it as an opportunity to cheat and shattered my life. It broke me, and thoughts of ending everything crossed my mind every day. She admitted to considering the same, but ultimately decided against it for my sake. I couldn't hold back and yelled, but how could you do this to me for an entire year? After calming down, I told her that I could never be open and vulnerable with her or anyone else again. She took my fears, weaknesses, and honesty and exploited them, forever changing me. I feared that this revelation was the catalyst for everything that followed considering the timing and all, as she claimed. However, I still wasn't entirely sure if I believed her when she said it was her first time engaging in such behavior. By this point, I was already about 45 minutes behind schedule. I knew I had to hurry on the highway, but my state of mind wasn't suitable for driving. Nonetheless, I left, promising to ponder her words and reach out if I had any further questions or thoughts. However, during the drive, all I could do was blast loud music and weep in anguish because my suspicions about causing this mess were confirmed. The journey was even more agonizing than the initial one after D-Day. In the end, I never called her again. Now, in the clarity of daylight, I find myself wondering if I was the cause of it all, and if she could have come across my posts and used them against me. But to be honest, she's not particularly active on social media, and I doubt she even uses Reddit. It was never on her phone, tablet, or in her app store history. I can't believe I let my guard down with anyone and shared things I shouldn't have. If I had never opened up, maybe I wouldn't be in this mess it feels like karma because I was thinking of leaving last fall anyway now 
I'm just going through the motions and it proves. I should put on a happy facade and never let my guard down again. It feels like I've completely destroyed everything I once had. Currently, I'm seeking guidance from my lawyer and trying to determine the best course of action because I don't know how I can reconcile with her after all that has happened. The truth is, she has once again shattered my heart and dismantled everything I held onto to keep moving forward. As for the legal aspects, I've enlisted the help of an attorney to handle those matters. Let me know who they should contact as you should seek legal advice for your actions. Can we please have a conversation about this and find a way to navigate through it? Please call me back. I apologize for the pain you must be experiencing. I understand that I don't deserve an opportunity to talk before you make your decisions. Perhaps we need some time for the situation to settle down. I know you likely have a higher opinion of me than I deserve. I would like to discuss counseling, but let's do so outside of work emails. Can you text or call me? I will be occupied with work and personal matters. I just wanted to inform you that I'll use your personal email from now on. Thanks for considering what I said. I hope you have someone to confide in. I understand that you must feel isolated. I know you always prioritize taking care of others more than yourself. How is P coping with the move? Please let them know I love them too. I'm genuinely sorry. Please call me soon. Love, I just had an epiphany. P, my parent, is losing everything they possess, their home of over 50 years and all the cherished memories as they transition to a care facility. Can you imagine how someone with dementia feels being uprooted like this? They have to be reminded every day because they forget, and then they have to endure the emotional toll all over again. I'm doing my best to handle it delicately, but it's challenging. We're in the process of determining what possessions they truly want to keep. Reflecting on our conversation, what struck me the most was her mention of not using work emails initially. Initially, I understood the idea of keeping personal matters separate from work correspondence, but then it dawned on me that she must have used her work phone for this. Her personal phone was always pristine, and I even helped her update it when she got a new watch last Christmas. I suppose there's still a possibility that I overlooked something, though. Anyway, here's an update. It's been approximately a month since my last post about the chaos that has consumed my life and my wayward wife, WW. If you're interested in the complete backstory, you can refer to my post history for all the details. To summarize, my wife, whom I've been married to for over 25 years, cheated on me for about a year while I was away caring for my elderly parent most of the week. On the positive side, my parent has been in a care facility for a little over a month now, and they appear to be adjusting fairly well. I visit them regularly, and they are happy to see me and still recognize me, at least most of the time. Additionally, I've managed to handle the packing and sale of their belongings, and I hope to finalize the real estate transaction this week. i found a temporary living arrangement that suits me well for now. I'm staying at a friend's place, conveniently located near my workplace. Initially, I contemplated immediately seeking an apartment, but this current setup is fulfilling my short-term needs. Now. Let's discuss the rest of the situation. I did serve her with divorce papers, and her lawyer responded in an aggressive manner. Recently, I had to address a maintenance issue at our previous home. Although it wasn't too severe, it required prompt attention. Fortunately, she wasn't present when I arrived to handle it. I met with the contractor, resolved the problem, and aimed to be gone before she returned. It took a few hours, but I managed to rearrange things and complete the task. However, my stroke of luck couldn't last long. Later that day, I received a call from a doctor informing me that she had been admitted to the hospital. It didn't come as a real surprise since I am still her emergency contact and spouse. Prior to my arrival, she had dialed for an ambulance, suspecting a heart attack, but it turned out to be a panic attack. However, she also mentioned persistent thoughts of self-harm, leading to her admission for observation. She has remained there since and I had to notify her employer about her medical leave. After conversing with the doctor, I realized it was necessary for me to go and see her. She had specifically requested my visit, but I had to approach the situation delicately due to her fragile state. I felt genuinely perplexed because I didn't want to visit if it was just part of the typical cheater script. Nevertheless, I still care for her and wish to prevent any harm or future struggles in taking care of herself. She has previously received mental health care, along with another lifelong chronic health condition. During those challenging times, I provided unwavering support and did everything possible to help her overcome those difficulties. 
Additionally, from a self-interested standpoint, I want to ensure that our ability to handle our shared responsibilities is not impacted. I sought advice from my friend, who stated that the decision to visit her rested solely with me. I also consulted my attorney, who cautioned me to be cautious, avoiding making promises or saying anything that could be used against me. I was aware even before visiting that cheaters often employ attempts to reconcile as a means of manipulation. I would be a complete wreck, although I have had my moments in private. Nonetheless, I'm striving to exhibit strength for both of us and maintain an optimistic outlook, despite my natural tendency towards pessimism. The most significant possibility, if it's not a lost cause, is that she will require extensive emergency surgery, chemotherapy, and assistance throughout her recovery. I have agreed to support her during the surgery, chemotherapy, and recovery, assuming that is the best case scenario. I haven't explicitly informed her yet that I will move in and stay with her, although it is likely what I will have to do. However, this decision hasn't altered my stance on divorce. I consulted my lawyer to determine the implications of this situation for our separation and whether we can still be considered separated during this time. They advise that we can treat it as an in-house separation, provided certain conditions aren't violated, even though meeting those conditions would be impossible anyway. Another concern of mine is how I can avoid shouldering a portion of her medical debt resulting from this situation, as it is likely to delay our divorce proceedings. My lawyer informed me that we can modify our settlement agreement, but she would need to agree that none of this debt falls on me. So the question remains, can I provide care for her during this time, avoid becoming emotionally entangled again, and still move forward with my life, regardless of how this situation unfolds? No matter the outcome, I will update those who are still interested. Finally, I met with the doctors, and they determined that it is stage 2 billion and has spread, although the tumors are still small and haven't reached the bladder or other distant organs, like the liver, which is typically difficult to treat. She will undergo significant surgeries and aggressive chemotherapy. I had already resolved to support her in her battle, regardless of her actions. I cannot simply abandon her to face this alone without any support. Some may argue that it is no longer my responsibility, but I suppose I cannot be as unfeeling as I initially believed I could be. I don't care about others' opinions. I'm doing this for myself. Despite providing support during this time, I will proceed with our separation and divorce. Unfortunately, I will likely have to temporarily move back in for an in-house separation to assist her for a while. I discussed this with my attorney, and they understand my position. They explain that we can still consider it as a period of separation, as long as we refrain from engaging in intimate relations, which won't be an issue for various reasons. We also need to agree that she won't complicate or prolong the process, as it seemed to be her initial plan. I will ensure she understands that my support comes with the condition that she doesn't contest or draw at the process. I will agree to give her time to stabilize her situation. I may feel guilty, as if I'm bargaining with her life, but everyone has their limits. In the next few days, she will undergo surgery for additional biopsies and a major operation. The treatment plan is aggressive, but it's crucial to halt the spread now. I don't require more specific details, as indicated by the title of my post. Surprisingly, her infidelity may have saved her life, as she likely would have detected this illness too late otherwise. So I suppose someone in this situation attains a victory. I appreciate all the comments and advice, knowing they come from a place of support. However, ultimately, the choices are mine to make. I simply want this phase of my life to proceed and eventually conclude. Afterward, I can't continue feeling obligated to anyone except my parents. Attachments only seem to bring pain, but I acknowledge that it's my fault for becoming attached in the first place. I will continue to monitor this account and may provide updates, but for now I suppose this is the path I must follow. I need to go for a walk. I've been at the hospital with WW since yesterday morning, and it's been incredibly challenging, just like everything else that has been happening. Firstly, she's in critical condition. During surgery, her vital signs deteriorated, and they had to halt the procedure due to uncontrollable blood pressure and other complications. 
The surgeon was able to remove a significant portion of the cancer, but not all of it. She will require additional surgery, but it's currently too risky. Last night, she even experienced a seizure that caused further damage and internal bleeding, necessitating another surgery. Although it wasn't initially recommended, they had to address the bleeding. She came out of that surgery earlier this morning, but has been drifting in and out of consciousness. The medical team is doing everything possible to prevent a stroke. I'm uncertain if she will pull through, and I've been running on no sleep for two days, envisioning the worst. She's somewhat more stable now, but the situation remains extremely delicate. Adding to the stress, while waiting for her initial surgery, I used her work phone and came across a message from her affair partner a few weeks ago from an unidentified number. I noticed that she had blocked his other number, but I kept their conversation as evidence. In the message, he inquired about her well-being and apologized for how he had treated her during their previous encounter. There's a whole story behind it that I don't wish to delve into, but essentially I tracked down the person involved, and things became messy and dangerous. He reached out to her, and she agreed to meet him in order to avoid legal trouble, although it transpired nonetheless. That was nearly a month ago. I did see her response to him, where she described him as the biggest mistake of her life, expressing regret for meeting him and stating that she wanted no further contact. She even asked him not to reach out for everyone's safety. I don't consider it significant since I discovered it myself, and she hasn't admitted anything to me. So I suppose she still keeps her secrets. I managed to go through everything, including her work emails and personal accounts. I even looked back well before last year but I found no suspicious activity prior to that. However, it doesn't change my stance on divorce or my willingness to assist her. I'm just venting because everything is in disarray right now. She might survive or pass away without ever knowing that I'm aware of this. And the only thing it reaffirms to me is that she's still capable of lying to me. I don't even know if we will ever have the opportunity to discuss it. I guess it doesn't truly matter at this point anyway. I might be finished with my post now because nothing else truly matters if she doesn't survive, or if she experiences brain damage or a worse condition than expected. Regardless, I will do everything within my power to support her and hope for the best. However, honestly, I tend to anticipate the worst. All I can hope for is to finally get some proper rest before the end of this week. Here's the latest update on the ongoing turmoil in my life. Today, WW's condition has been unstable, mostly deteriorating. It appears that she may have experienced a minor stroke, but she's somehow holding on and showing slight signs of improvement. While she's not out of danger yet, the doctors are cautiously optimistic. She has been more conscious lately, but the pain is intense and she's on strong medications. They have transferred her out of the intensive care unit and it's likely that she will undergo rehabilitation before returning home on Thursday. Unexpectedly, W's best friend, M, reached out to me. We hadn't spoken since all of this began and I assumed she was supporting WW no matter what. I left her a voicemail the night after W's initial surgery, in case they hadn't been in touch, informing her that WW might not survive. I suggested that if she wanted to see her, she should do so soon, just in case the worst were to happen. M and I were never extremely close, although they have been friends since their teenage years and attended college together. We've spent time together during holidays and a couple of vacations. So on Thursday... M called me and expressed her condolences for what we were going through. She mentioned that she would like to visit WW and asked if she could stay at the house. I assumed she might still think I was living there. I told her she could stay and use W's car if necessary. I have been staying at the house part-time, so it's not completely empty, but it still pains me to be in my own home. Nevertheless, I agreed because M has always been a genuinely kind-hearted person and I understand that losing her friend weighs heavily on her. On Thursday evening, I picked her up from the airport, and we headed straight to the hospital. During the journey, we discussed W's condition in more detail and what had transpired since the surgery. Finally, M reveals that she knows about what happened between WW and me. She explains that WW only confided in her a few days before being admitted to the hospital initially, when she received the news about her cancer diagnosis and divorce papers. M mentioned that they hadn't spoken much last year, not like before, but she attributed it to WW struggling with her own health issues and not being adept at dealing with the potential loss of her best friend. Interestingly, M had shared her suspicions with WW that her own husband was having an affair 
and how they were trying to work through it. According to M, she believed it was merely an emotional affair and that he had developed a crush on someone at work but hadn't acted upon it. Eventually, he realized the risks involved and returned to Monsieur. I didn't say much about it except to advise her to verify everything he was saying. I hadn't come across any mention of this in W's text messages. However, considering our age group, we're probably more inclined to phone calls rather than texting, so it makes sense. The irony and painful realization for both of us were that she was actually advising WW on how to address the issue with her husband and navigate their marriage counseling. She was assisting her in setting boundaries and demanding the respect she deserved, among other things. M shared with me how they had numerous arguments when she confronted WW about everything. She wasn't sure if their friendship could survive after discovering how deceitful WW had been to both of us. M even admitted to expressing her anger and stating that WW deserved whatever consequences she faced in the divorce. It was surprising because M is not the type to use foul language. She's quite religious and proper. After the argument, WW tried calling M several times, but M ignored the calls. That's also why she didn't answer my call, especially when I reached out to her. She thought I might be trying to involve her further in the situation. However, upon hearing my voicemail, M realized that she couldn't stay away without seeing WW again, just in case the worst were to happen. She didn't want their last interaction to be during a heated argument, so she called me to arrange a visit to the hospital. We spent a significant amount of time together this weekend, but don't worry, it wasn't in any inappropriate way. M shared more insights with me after her visits with WW. We spoke almost every night until very late, and it was quite comforting because she never pressured me to stay together. However, I could sense that after each visit, she was growing more understanding. Last night, M surprised me by revealing something unexpected. WW had asked her to talk to me about DNR and what to do if her condition worsened. WW wasn't sure if, in a deteriorating situation, I would be able to make the decision to take her off life support. She also expressed that if her condition reached a point of unbearable suffering or significant disabilities, she wished to end her life. WW asked M to convince me to let her go if the time came and if I reached out about it or if M couldn't handle the outcome. I'm not even sure under which circumstances, other than being brain dead, such a decision would be legally permissible. Here tonight, I'm going to have a conversation with her about this entire situation. However, honestly, I'm unsure of what to say. I'm the kind of person who believes in not prolonging someone's suffering, and in the right circumstances, I would likely make the right decision. But I can't commit to anything beyond that, and I will never be certain if I'm doing it solely to escape this immense pain or not. Even in the appropriate medical scenario, I think I would carry an immense burden of guilt indefinitely. I will also discuss this with my therapist, but my appointment isn't until later this week. Before she left, I asked her friend M if she would consider being the medical power of attorney for my wife, and she is contemplating it. I will also approach a close relative, even though they live far away, but I can't guarantee that they will agree to it. I will refrain from making any decisions other than those that are legally required. I had a brief conversation with my attorney, and we have arranged a meeting for tomorrow. However, this evening, I will inform her that I comprehend her wishes, but I am unable to give my consent at this moment.